How wealthy people save and spend money. Secrets revealed. It's Brian Preston, the money guy. Brian, I love and am so excited about the shows that we get to do where we reveal some secrets that we've been able to garner, not only from like our own personal financial success, but in our day jobs, we get to work with wealthy folks all over the country, helping them make sound financial decisions. And every time we meet a new person and hear their story and hear the things that they've done, we're able to sort of amalgamate those yeah. traits. And whenever we put it together, we're like, hey, there's some common stuff here that maybe our audience could learn from and benefit from. Well, there's common stuff that we have learned, but here's what I think is interesting. There's a complete disconnect from what the media and social, you know, all the social stuff sure. out there, the Twitters, the Facebooks, they're showing you one thing and then we're actually learning what mm -hmm. real wealth is. There's a disconnect. Yep. So I, anytime I can create a bridge to let you see where you're kind of being misled, mm -hmm. or you know, as we put in the title, secrets revealed. We're kind of breaking open stuff so you guys can can learn and apply this stuff to your own finances. I think that's a win-win situation. Absolutely. And so one of the things we thought is, okay, if you don't don't just take our word for it that the world and society kind of gets it wrong. We wanted to kind of give you some practical, real-world examples, and we sort of. Uh, what I love is it's like a little time capsule of real world, real world examples because it doesn't change. Well, I, I thought it was, you're, you're being sweet, but what we really did was we did what was Brian's <laughs> idea, which was Robin Leach and right? Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, Yep, because I'm older. And then Bo's idea was... Mine was Cribs. When I was coming up, you used to see Cribs. <laughs> well, then, uh, you know, one of the things that keeps our content and all of our stuff so fresh mm -hmm. is that our team is young and vibrant. And so I thought I was the young guy. And I was like, oh, no, Cribs is the thing. And they're like, no, are you kidding yeah. me? What? That's like, that's like reruns, right? That's like the old stuff. What they said is, no, there's a better example of what the rich and the famous are doing these days. And that's the Kardashians. Well, and think about it. The Kardashians have actually made an entire empire off of just basically their lifestyle yep. because i mean there's all kind of discussions we even in, in the in the show meeting we were trying to figure out which one of the kardashians was the richest has the highest because network, i think yeah. the one well, I, I don't know there i know kim because but um i think the uh, the upper left is who kendall right kendall is is she a billionaire is I think that she's somebody a billionaire she, yeah, she was she's a billionaire? on the forbes billionaire list which is pretty so remarkable. i mean that's pretty incredible when you can turn a lifestyle into products. I think they do makeup, makeup lines and, and um, apps and other stuff, but that's kind of wild. So, but they're also putting out an image. I think you, you cannot tell me, by the way, nothing that you see within that sphere of, of reality TV is really tied to reality. Sure. A lot of that is structured. A lot of that is choreographed. So I, I want to tell you, I want to kind of open the curtain, let you see what's really going on. So you can make sure you make the right decisions and let this stuff be entertainment but not let it be the compass that guides you towards how you live your life. Yeah, and so I think one of the things that's happened is when we think about like wealthy people, when we think mm -hmm. about folks who've had financial success, there are certain things that kind of come to mind. You know, yep. you think of like big houses or big whatever. And so we said, you know, let, let's look at some of the items that people associate with wealth and kind of look at the data behind them, some of the figures behind them. Well, and I thought it was let's let's talk about some of the trappings because sure. that's what the the first thing. And I've fallen prey to this. Yep. And, and I and I want to I want to help you guys learn from what I've learned. And the first thing I think a lot of people now I don't think the younger generation falls in this no. trap. But if you go to Las Vegas, between every big casino, it seems like the walkway between the, the all the big casinos they put malls, mm -hmm. and in between these mall and, and in, inside these malls. There's always these luxury goods. Mm -hmm. It's always going to be the the designer purses, the designer watches. And I was out there with a friend last January. It was a, his his wife and my wife. We we did a couples trip out there, and um, we stopped in. He's a big watch guy. Sure. And we stopped in every watch store. There's brands that I didn't even know existed because I, I thought you know luxury watch Rolex. Rolex. That's the and one, then yeah. he was he he said there's all these brands above it. But and he's trying these things on, and I'm sitting there thinking. Not interested. Yep. And 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 but in, and I think that this is part of what society pushes forward or the media pushes forward because they tell you, hey, if you're successful, the tra one of the trappings you're going to have is that luxury that watch. watch. But the data actually doesn't say that that's necessarily rich people that are buying those luxury watches. What we found is that 74 percent of Rolex owners make less than $120,000 a year. Now, don't, don't mishear us. So we're not suggesting that $120,000 a year is not a fantastic household income. But when you look at the cost of one of these watches and the cost that it could become, because, you know, there's a pretty wide range, 
that's a substantial chunk of your income if you're making less than 120,000 for something that you could get utility from for a much lower cost. Yeah, I mean, think about that. I mean, look, 120,000 is a great income, but you shouldn't have five to seven percent of your annual income in something that could fall off your wrist. That's exactly right. Or a magician could take it at a dinner party. Yep. I mean, it's um, it's it's that type of stuff. Um, and here's what I think. I think the new trend, because I I've, I told you I've fallen in this trap when I was in my early 30s, started having a little success. What's funny is I think I was probably right around this stage of income. I did buy myself a Rolex. Yep. And um, as a reward, you set a goal. Yeah, and I you set a goal, goal when my income hit a certain level, and I would and I would do the Rolex. It just sits in a drawer now. I have yeah. insurance, and by the way, it costs me money because I have insurance, have insurance on it, sure. and it just sits in my drawer. Um, I get much more utility out of this um, Apple, Apple Watch, yep. and, and I think that's starting to be the trend of younger people. Absolutely. Is that you, I see, uh, like it was interesting after Christmas, I noticed um, FTE Daniel sitting in the content meeting. I looked to my right, and I'm like, oh, oh, he's rocking, scroll. he's rolling, yeah. rocking the Apple Watch now. I so love it. Um, I think we're pretty much Nate. You got the Apple Watch. No, not so yet. what are we, three out of five? Yeah, yep, three, out, three of five. out of five. So Don't that's worry, pretty, it's pretty impressive. So what's, what's the, the next thing was cars. Yeah, the, uh, the other thing that's really interesting is when people think about success and they think about wealthy people, they think, oh, they must drive like the really fancy, really nice car. Well, Dave Ramsey even mentions, I think part of his big Yale mantra mm-hmm. was, you know, we're a, a BMW is no longer kind of your goal for being success. It's a paid off. It's a paid off. Paid car. off life, that's essentially. That's right. Uh, and what we found is that the median income of luxury car buyers, and you know we're talking about luxury brands here, so BMW, Mercedes, you know, fill in the blank, uh, is actually less than a hundred thousand dollars a year. And what's great is uh, Daniel let us kind of dive into this a little bit, even geographically. He found that uh, Georgia, as a state, has the highest luxury car ownership at fourteen point two percent of the population are luxury car owners. So Georgia likes buying nice cars. In Texas. They actually had the lowest median income for luxury car buyers at about 84000 So in Texas, the median income was lower, but they're still buying luxury cars. I don't know if that's cost of living cars. or if they're just bad decision makers. Everything's a little bit bigger there, I hear. Uh, in Ohio, the median income is at the high end for luxury car buyers. So folks in Ohio that buy luxury cars actually have a median income of about 156000 So now that's kind of... So we have two sense. former Ohio residents. Would y'all say that's because y'all are better decision makers in Ohio? More oh, they're practical? nodding. They're Look nodding. They are totally <laughs> nodding. I think that's awesome. Uh, and so, I, I, and I'm sure one of them put this in. The study found that uh, people in the Midwest seem to be more financially responsible, at least when it comes to luxury car purchases. Don't mishear us. We're not saying that luxury cars are bad. It's not a negative thing. But if you are someone who's going to purchase a luxury car, you want to make sure that you're following the appropriate order of operations. And when you buy it, you're buying it for a reason that's not setting aside your other long-term financial goals. Well, first, goals. luxury cars should be paid for same as cash. That's right. I mean, you're not, you're not financing luxury cars for an extended period of time. That's why we have the 23-8 provision, yep. where it's 20% down payments. You know, don't finance it for more than three years yep. on an amortization, no more than 8%. And that's only on regular cars. Mm-hmm. Not luxury. And then there's another caveat is that you always need to be investing more than your car payment. If you have a thousand dollar car payment and only putting three hundred dollars a month in your Roth, you're doing it completely wrong. So don't get those backwards. But here's the other part I found interesting. When we think of luxury cars, these are not cars that are probably twenty five thousand dollars. These are cars that are forty, fifty, sixty, even seventy, eighty thousand dollars. We know that from Stop Acting Rich, another book by Dr. Thomas Stanley, the, the late Dr. Thomas Stanley, he found that the median price for millionaires on car purchases is a right above $31,000. So when I hear that, I'm that does not scream to me luxury car. That sounds like a used car to me. That sounds like a used car, or maybe a very affordable new car. That does not scream trappings of success, which shows that millionaires on, on average – are probably pretty reasonable when it comes to their car purchase. Well, in the stat, we've done this on other shows. The average cost for a new car in the United States is thirty-four thousand, um, a little over thirty-four thousand dollars. So millionaires definitely pay less. Less than average. The other thing I thought was interesting is that the average auto loan now is seventy-two months. So for a full six years, and we know cars depreciate like a rock. Uh, you know, can I tell one brief aside really yeah, quickly? Go ahead. Uh, so yesterday, uh, you know, we have some inclement weather here. 
and my wife had a little bit of an accident. Yeah. And uh, fortunately, she was fine. The kids were fine. Uh, but I'm, I'm thinking the car's probably going to be total, right? I think they're probably going to total the car. I can't tell you how sick I would be if I was thinking to myself, man, I bought this car and I financed it over 72 months. Yeah. And then something out of our control, bad weather, ice in the road, she slides off, and the car's told an interest as a company says, hey, we're not going to fix this. We're just going to give you a check for what it's worth. And they give me that check, and I look at it, and I say, oh, my goodness. Yeah. I owe more on this car than what this check is worth. Yeah, it stinks that this life thing happened to us, but thankfully the car was paid for. We owned it outright, so we don't have to deal with, oh, no, what to do now. If you're financing your cars over 60, 72, 84 months, it is a ticking time bomb for some things that possibly are outside of your control. Well, and I've had some people in the comments section have really gotten confused on this because they say, look, car loans are so cheap, practically at 0%. Why wouldn't I take as long as they would give it to me at 0%? The thing I always share with everybody is, look, this car is depreciating so quick. You don't want to get in a situation just like yep. Bo described where you lose the car. You owe more than the car is actually worth because now you've gotten yourself in an underwater situation. Yep. It's better because these cars depreciate so quickly to pay them off rapidly, even if you get one of those great low rates or even a 0% rate. Just pay attention because depreciation is horrible. So we notice, uh, we know that uh, millionaires, folks that are successful, I'm going to say wealthy, rich people, they don't focus on the trappings of success, the fancy cars, the watches, the expensive things. So we said, okay, well, what are the things that wealthy people focus on? What are some uh, data data nuggets we could give you guys to show you what wealthy people focus on and spend their time doing. Yeah. So we, we actually have something that it's, it's the habits mm -hmm. of wealthy people. Yep. We've compiled this, we've covered it before in other shows, but I find it interesting is because wealthy people, if I was trying to think about from my own experience, I do think they focus on exercise yep. and we'll, we'll confirm that in a second. That's right. I think they focus on how they use their time because mm -hmm. we even realize the millionaire next door talks about traits and they focus their time well in a mm -hmm. very organized way that will help them. They're effective allocators of their, their time resources. What did we find? Because I think that's what a lot of these habits will illustrate. Yeah, some of the things I think that were really, really, really interesting is that if you look at millionaires, on average, I'm going to talk about their time first. They spend a little bit less than an hour a week playing video games. Mm -hmm. If you look at the average American, they spend almost two hours a week playing video games. So the millionaire on our, uh, is, is about half of what the average American does. So then you think about, okay, where do they spend their time? Millionaires on average spend about five and a half hours per week reading, only about two hours for the average American. So rather than, uh, again, not suggesting that video games are bad, or if that's something you enjoy that you shouldn't do it. But it is interesting, the thing that millionaires do seems to be about expanding knowledge, increasing knowledge base, doing something in that. They also prioritize not only keeping their mental well-being strong, but also their physical well-being. They spend about 5.8 hours, almost six hours per week exercising. Average American only spends about two and a half hours per week. Exercising. So essentially sharpening the brain through having a healthy body yep. as well as just be having a curiosity. I mean, I, you guys have probably seen the same anecdotal stuff I've seen on the internet where somebody was talking about how do you tell if somebody has a high IQ and they had somebody did an experience share with Elon Musk is that he was doing an interview and one of the people that was doing the, the job interview came from a chicken farm, like mm -hmm. grew up on a chicken farm. Sure. He spent, Elon Musk spent the entire interview questioning what is it like to run a, a chicken farm? Just because he was and so the, curious. And the takeaway was he was truly curious about the logistics of running a chicken farm. It. And I think that's the thing that when I see somebody, when you see that successful people are reading twice as much as the average American, mm -hmm. I think that is the indicator of curiosity. And curiosity is an indicator of intelligence. So guys, start doing the habit of always being a student of life and expanding your skill set, expanding your knowledge, because I find I even learn a, a lot more. Look, I come from a dyslexic, ADH, ADH um, background. Yeah. Um, 
you you can do audiobooks and still get a lot and, and 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 really get the brain working in the same way as if you're not the type of person that does it the traditional reading method too. Uh, what I I love this, Brian. If if you're out there and you're listening on like Stitcher, iTunes, iHeartRadio, one of those. Uh, we do these shows live, right? And so this show right now live, we have an audience in here that's giving me some feedback in our chat section. And a lot of folks are saying, hey, where where can I get this? Where do you have this infographic? Can I grab it? You know, this is just something we sort of create, created internally. Reeves, maybe we should turn this into something we can make available as a yeah. deliverable. But if you do want to know more, if you want to kind of understand what the portrait of a millionaire looks like, you can go to our website, go to moneyguide.com slash resources. And we actually have a deliverable that's titled the portrait of today's millionaire that kind of walks through some different sections of what millionaires do, how they behave, what they look like. If this is something that you're curious about, go to the website moneyguide.com slash resources, check out this deliverable, share it with your friends, and uh, let people see that you know what real millionaires look like, not what the world tells you they look like. So, Bob, I'd like to kind of jump in and let's kind of talk about what are the traits that successful people had figured out. Love it. So the first thing I think of is they understand value. They understand value. Um, and and that's, a, that's, a, that's a big part is because if you think about, there's all kind of stats. I love, and I've already mentioned it once in the show today, Stop Acting Rich by Dr. Thomas Stanley, the, the late Dr. Thomas Stanley. He talks about that millionaires, just some a few examples, they pay like $16 for haircuts. <laughs> now, I, here's what that, I do. That I, one I found a little interesting. Well, here's what I think is interesting, is that I couldn't, I don't think I could get a $16 haircut around here, but what I have learned is, because there's a barbershop right here called Uncle Barbershop, mm -hmm. and, and they typically charge in the mid-20s for a guy's haircut, mm -hmm. but if I buy 12 haircuts at once, do like a baker's <laughs> dozen, the price does go below $20 a okay. haircut. So I think that it's still, it's just that mentality of, how can you get common expenses and think like a financial mutant and get those costs down? So for me, bundling and buying all at once is a, is a cost-effective way to do that. Yeah, I think it's interesting. It says that uh, millionaires pay that little for the haircut, uh, and only 6% of millionaires interviewed in the book spend more than $1,000 on a suit. So you think yeah. about like the fancy, well-tailored, perfect suit that's super expensive. It doesn't seem like that's what wealthy, successful people are spending their money on. I thought, you know, because there's also all this research about drinking habits. Mm -hmm. You know, if you if you if you enjoy a good glass of wine, um, I thought it was interesting that it said only seven point three percent of millionaires owned a bottle of wine that cost over a hundred dollars. I'm trying. I don't. I, I don't. I don't mind sharing this. I have I, neighbors. I should. I have, do not own a bottle of wine. To show $100. prep. I should have done my uh, one of my neighbors because he is a big wine mm -hmm. person. Yeah. I should have asked him how many bottles. I mean, he probably is he a, a over, wine person because, like, Mister Wonderful on the Shark Tank, he he, he fancies himself sure. a wine person yep. as well. I did think. Here's the other part of that. Four in ten own a bottle under ten dollars. No. That one I can check. We actually do have under ten. <laughs> Got the $10 Boone's <laughs> Farm strawberry wine or something That's sitting in the the fridge. So red is ours. The other thing choice. I thought was interesting is this is number two. They recognize that there are two ways to build wealth. Yeah. So we you hear us talk about this all the time when it comes to wealth building, when it comes to making financial decisions, when it comes to getting your house in order. There are really two things that you can do. Uh, the first is spend less. That's yeah, common right. sense. If I need to save more, if I need to have more, I need to spend less. I need to cut my expenses, cut back, budget, fill in the blank. So that's option number one, spend less. But option number two is, or I could go make more money. Maybe yeah. I don't want to spend less. Maybe I want to maintain this lifestyle. I don't want to spend less. I just want to go out there and create more wealth. I want to go make more money. And there's two ways. We kind of, we talk about this is, and we focus on the second one. There's two ways to even make more money yep. is you can go work harder and that's with your back, your brains, your hands, but you go find that there's, there's limitations to that eventually mm -hmm. on what you, and what you, your goal is, is to make it where, because financial independence is really having money created for you while you sleep or while you go travel or mm -hmm. go do something else. So that's what we call working smarter. That's yep. your army of dollar bills is working just as hard as you are with your back, your hands, your brain. That's the ultimate goal, and that's what we spend a lot of time focusing on here at The Money Guy Show. Now, what I think is so beautiful about your army of dollar bills and recognizing how it works, one of our missions, one of the things that we are going to set out to do is prevent this thing from happening where folks get into their 50s and 60s and they say, oh, 
Now I get how powerful my army of dollar bills is. Now I see how valuable it is. We want to flip the script and we want our folks that are in their 20s and maybe even mm -hmm. in their teens to come out recognizing how much more powerful, how much more valuable their army of dollar bills can even be than their 50 or 60 year old peers. They might not have a big army, but man, are their soldiers fully loaded. Yeah, I mean, because here's the, here's the goal. I want y'all to, to listen up on this part is that your goal is to turn the hard work into army of dollars as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. And you're saying, well, why, why is that? I, I get the part that I want my money to work while I sleep, but here's what I want, I want people to understand. The quicker you get your money into your army of dollar bills, it's actually better for tax purposes Absolutely, too. Because yep. there is, think about capital assets versus most of the time when you work with your backs, your brains, and your hands, that's what's considered ordinary mm -hmm. income. That's yep. wages. That's your self-employment income. That's even small business income. All that's going to be taxed as ordinary income. As soon as you get it into the investment type of assets, your army of dollars, think about the fact that capital gains, mm -hmm. dividends, uh, and even your retirement accounts, Favorable tax all those get much better tax rates and tax treatment. So it's better for you from even a tax standpoint. Mm -hmm. It's also the sooner you own stuff, the more inflation resistant it is. That's exactly right. We, we get this question all the time, Brian. People say, hey, you know, I, I, we've been in this like super low interest rate environment, right? They've gone, from, it seems like rates are going to go up. We don't know when, we don't know with what speed, but it seems pretty likely that, you know, interest rates are going to go up. And we know that when interest rates go up, the price of goods go up. And that means that inflation is going to come. What, yeah. what are you guys thinking? How are you preparing for pending inflation? And our answer is relatively simple. Yeah. Own stuff. Own stuff. I mean, that really is own stuff that can continue to create income. Um, you know, and, and we'll get into that in a little bit later sure. in the show. But here's something, strategies to consider you should consider if you want to, you know, act like a wealthy person in the wealth creation side of things. Here's some strategies to consider. First... Start the systematic savings ASAP. We always say that the best time to start investing is yesterday. So that means that the second best time to start investing is today. And if you do not believe us, I want you to go to our website, go to moneyguy.com slash resources. And we have a deliverable titled, How Powerful Are Your Dollars? And in that deliverable, we show you what your wealth multiplier is. We show how a 20-year-old can take $1 and turn it into 88 by the time they turn 65. So it doesn't take a lot of dollars to turn into a lot of wealth. But every year that you age, that wealth multiplier decreases a yep. little bit. So the earlier you can start, the earlier you can get that systematic savings, the earlier you're going to set yourself up for long-term success. So you just said something key there is the younger you start, the more powerful your dollars are. You know what else is powerful? Free money. Oh, absolutely. So don't overlook the employer sweeteners. I'm talking about matching money on your retirement plan with your employer. I'm talking about the employee stock purchase plan. Yeah, that's I'm, one that's overlooked, Bo. I'm so glad that you say that. We People get it all the time. They're like, employer match. Mm -hmm. I get that, guys. I get that. You mm -hmm. tell me. I'm not going to miss it. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go get that employer match. And we'll have prospects reach out to us. And we'll say, okay, great. Can we see your benefits? And we'll go start looking. We're like, hey, we noticed that your company offers an employee stock purchase plan. And you say, oh, no, I've listened to your show. I know that because all of my human capital is tied up in my company, I probably don't need to own company stock because, you know, that's dangerous. I'll be over-concentrated. I listen to the show and we're like, yes, that's true. There's some merit to that. But if your company is offering you a discount, like you can buy the stock at a 15% discount, do you know what that's essentially the same as? It's the same as an employee, right? It is free money that you can go out there and get. So if you're not taking advantage of an employee stock purchase plan, you might be missing out on just free and clear money out well, there. Well, I also think some of these plans are so generous in the fact that not only do they give you a discount on the stock purchase of like 15%, a lot of times they will take the lower price oh, yeah. yep. of either the beginning of the quarter or the end of the quarter. So whatever the price of the stock is, beginning or end, they give you the lower Absolutely. of the two. Think about the fact that like we've had a quarter. We just went over our quarterly commentary yep. It's not uncommon to have a quarter that could be double digits. Mm -hmm. You might have a 10% quarter, 
And if you could get a 10% discount, I mean, essentially buy at the beginning of the quarter mm -hmm. price plus a 15% discount. Discount, discount, you can quickly see Huge. that this is something that you might want to consider because, and that's why we put it into in the financial order of operations. This is under that employer match segment. So don't overlook that. The last thing I put on this was deferred comp plans or to, deferred comp plans oh, yeah. or top hat plans for higher income that's individuals. Because a lot of people, you know, you you get into a higher tax rate, and we know that, that that's when you really are paying a lot of taxes. Companies will give you the potential to essentially figure out how much you want to pay taxes on, push the rest towards retirement. Yep. Now. Some of them offer a match, which mm -hmm. is powerful, or some other generous thing. But here's something I do want to give you one word of caution. The reason the IRS allows corporations to offer these sweet deals where they allow executives to choose how much of their income is going to be taxable because they're going to defer the rest for the future is because it's at risk mm -hmm. for the company. That's Meaning right. if the company you work for gets into financial jeopardy, that money that you could have been paid last year or paid in the, in the next few months that got deferred could be at risk if the company gets in trouble. So always be aware of that when you make that decision for those top hat or, or tax deferred plans. If you work for a company, you're just not so sure they're on stable financial ground. You and, need to be aware of that. You need to be aware of that limitation. So, okay, so Brian, I know that there's a lot of listeners out there saying, okay, guys, I'm in. I got it. You, um, you've locked me in. I'm going to go start dollar cost averaging. I'm going to go start saving. I'm going to go start getting my army dollar bills working. Uh, what do, do I, I guess I need to go to Morningstar and go find which stock. <laughs> I need to get my Wall Street Journal, and I need to go start, you know, teach me how to go pick the investments because I'm ready to start maximizing. Well, I, I think in a year, we just came through 2020, and the big stories that came out of 2020 was if you were an investor, you could have made a 1,000% if you mm -hmm. bought Tesla at yep. the right time. You could have made a 1,000% if you bought Bitcoin. When I hear these type of things, I'm always like, I'm just so worried about everybody that hears these stories and they go, man, I should have gotten in on that. And then they, they make the mistake of, you know, that thousand percent's gone, mm -hmm. by the way. If you go buy a Tesla right now, you don't make a thousand, you don't get the thousand percent that your neighbor might have gotten down the street. So you might not be nailing it when, right. you know, doing it well, especially if you momentum buy into some of these mm -hmm. things that have already had the, their big runs. I always think that there's, you're actually outsmarting yourself, too. The, the better decision is, and I talked about this in a recent, in that live stream, I believe mm -hmm. we did yesterday, is that you have to decide what type of investor you are. Um, are you going to be an investor who dabbles? Or are you going to be an investor that's actually doing this for a living to build financial independence for yourself? Because it's no different than a fisherman. Mm -hmm. A fisherman who does it for a living to, like his life depends upon it, like your life will depend upon it in retirement, they're not spear fishing. Mm -mm. They are throwing nets in the water. Big old net. Um, the way you fish or invest like a fisherman is you buy index funds because you're casting a very wide net. When you buy index funds, they're very tax efficient. They have very low costs. And guess what? They outperform about 80% mm -hmm. of all the other funds out there from a historical standpoint. We've done a number of shows on that. If you go look it up, yep. you can see those deep dives we've done. But that's the way if you're investing like your life depends upon it. You're going to cast a broad net. You're not going to stand there and try to hunt for Moby Dick, uh, you know, like Captain Ahab did. I mean, that's, <laughs> that really is the analogy that people ought to take in, in into mind is I want you to be a successful investor. So here's the thing. And Bo, you, you said this, mm -hmm. this was probably a month ago. And I was like, wow, that, that clicks with me. Target or index target retirement funds because you only have to come up with two decisions. Only two questions you have to answer. How much can you save? And when do you need the money? If yep. you can answer those two questions, you can go to a place like Vanguard or Fidelity Investments, and they have index target retirement funds that are practically free mm -hmm. that will do all the heavy lifting on how to invest and what, you know, you don't have to get all complicated. And what I think is wonderful, and if you're someone starting out, and we consider starting out, folks, when you're beginning to build your army of dollar bills, before it gets to a critical mass of like four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars, that's kind of the critical mass where we see a shift happen. Up until that point, your savings rate, how many of your soldiers you're putting in your army, is exponentially more important than your rate of return. Amen to the that. The rate of return will come if you can focus on the savings rate and getting as many soldiers in the army as possible. 
you're gonna set yourself up for long-term success. So get rid of the noise. Just do the target retirement index fund, build to that critical mass, and you will be amazed at how quickly it moves. Focus on what's important and not the noise. That yep. the, That's a, another one of those big fibs that society is pushing on people constantly. Yep. Well done, Bo. So number three, wealthy people kind of understand taxes suck. <laughs> I mean, they really do. I mean, and, and if you need proof, here, here's the thing. There's this trend right now going around. I see it all over Twitter, and I see it with people that I know follow our show. Mm -hmm. And I hope that I don't upset them with this next statement because I come from a background of 16 years of tax preparation. Um, and I know that, the, matter of fact, I think earlier in our working career, didn't you have some software company that paid you some tremendous dividend? Oh, yeah. Still own it. I'm not going to say it, but I bought it because the dividend was killer. And I was like, are you kidding me? That's like a built-in rate of return. Well, it seems, and look, I'm not, I don't have anything wrong with dividend investing to, to, to a degree, but you do need to understand that dividends historically are not the most tax favored right. uses of money. And what do I mean by that is that realize for a company, a corporation to pay you a dividend, they first have to pay income taxes on the money. Mm -hmm. And then after they've paid income taxes, they can distribute it to their shareholders. And guess what? You as the shareholder will also have to pay income taxes yep. on it. So there's a double taxation that occurs there. So just be aware of that. I'm not, and, and realize that company, I always think about this too, would that company be better served sending the money out to the investors or would they be better served trying to grow and expand their current business? Yep. And that leads to, if you need proof that there might be something to that that situation I just explained, Let's talk about Warren Buffett. Yep, Berkshire. Do you guys realize Berkshire Hathaway doesn't do dividends? Mm -hmm. And you ask yourself, wait a minute, Uncle Warren, I think he's issued one dividend and he said, I must have been in the bathroom when they made that decision <laughs> because he, that's the joke he has said about it. It's because he does not issue dividends for, for this reason right here. He doesn't think they're tax efficient. He thinks, first of all, he'd have to either liquidate currently appreciated holdings mm -hmm. to generate cash, and we all know Berkshire has lots of cash, or he'd have to use his powder money um, that he's holding in cash to, for the, the the float for insurance policies and other things, and he just does not like that. And then here's the last part. Warren, and the, the data kind of supports this, or it has in the past, he thinks he's better with his money, with the money of Berkshire Hathaway, then you, the investor, he'd d give the dividend out to. So he'd rather keep the money in the company so he can continue to grow. And I think there's something to be learned and from that. I, think, I don't think he's actually shy about that. I think he's actually said, as he closes out his shareholder letters, if it gets to the point where I believe the opportunities present to our investors are more attractive than the opportunities present to Berkshire Hathaway, we'll issue a dividend. Until that time, we're just going to hold on to and, it. And we all know, I, I'm sure, well, I know, Berkshire Hathaway has much better opportunities than you and I would have. Sure. I mean, because they're big. I mean, I always, here's the thing, and I don't mean to spend too much time on this, but when you read the end of a, a, a letter to shareholders, I always thought this was a brilliant move from Warren. He puts at the end of most letter to shareholders, if you own a small private business with revenue over this level and with margins at this level, and you're getting to the end of your career that you'd like to get rid of the company, reach out to him. Yep. Talking about shooting fish in the it's, barrel. Makes it easy. He basically has given his filter for what he wants. He's let people know he's always buying and always interested. And there's people that if you're successful, you might be thinking, you know what would be a feather in my cap that I'd like to have? That I sell out to Berkshire Hathaway. So it's a great, great win-win situation for all parties involved. But not all like wealthy, successful people are CEOs that control a company, control the dividend payouts. We even see there are some other behaviors that wealthy, uh, that wealthy families and wealthy people employ. And one of the reasons they employ those things is because they understand that paying taxes is less than there ideal. There is a lot. I mean, coming from a background of professional tax preparation, if you want to make a client love you, Save them money on taxes, yep. and if you need to, if you want to know how the, the the strategies and the levels people will go to save taxes, think about this: Why do celebrities, titans of industries, and politicians all have foundations? Mm -hmm. Have you have you ever guys ever thought of that? Every politician, most titans of industry, and then a lot of celebrities all have foundations. Now, a lot of you guys, you might be thinking, well, wow. They're, They're charitably, charitably minded, minded. And, and that's true. I'm sure that in, in a, a big portion of it is they are very charitably minded. 
But these things are incredible tax planning tools. And maybe I'm maybe I'm like the Grinch for sharing this, but I think it's important for you to understand all facets of money. Here's why foundations are so powerful to these titans, celebrities, and politicians is that they can pay kiddos and family, meaning that you, you can actually put family members on the payroll. You can also make expensive travel favored. Mm-hmm. And here's, I can give you proof on that is, do you guys realize 25% of chartered private jets and private flights are designated as charitable flights? Now, when I heard that, that's like, that's one out of four. Yeah. One out of yeah. four private flights. That's why I'm not saying something charity. that's to, to just be controversial. I'm actually giving you the proof. Yep. This is the strategy they're doing. I mean, it's amazing how many of these foundations are using private jets in their goals. And, and that, that's something to be learned from. So maybe you're not someone sitting out there that's the CEO of a publicly traded company that control dividend policy. Or maybe you haven't attained the level of wealth yet where you're thinking about setting up a private foundation for your private jet. But there are some strategies that you can begin to employ, that you can begin to think about that will help you in that same vein decrease what you pay in taxes. And we thought just one of like the big ones, this is like uh, the like, like money guy, uh, special, like napalm, exciting stuff are Roth assets. Yeah. Assets that grow tax free forever are huge. And I think that wealthy folks and folks who aspire to be wealthy recognize the value in Roth assets. You just said it right there, who aspire to be. I know we recognize the federal government and the tax code, Roth has limits on Mm -hmm. it. They don't want super affluent people loading up on the Roth assets. So they put income limitations, they put restrictions. If you're a younger person and you aspire to be wealthy, take advantage of those Roth accounts because the tax-free growth, tax-free compounding growth is going to be a ticket to a lot of success for you in the future. Now, I was having a conversation with a neighbor a few nights ago and they uh, figured this out. He said, man, I figured out that Roth is awesome and I love it and I love it and I love it. And it was true for him, but he's, his, his trajectory and his income has changed over the course of his career. Uh, we love Roth assets. We love you building tax-free assets, but not at any cost. So what he had been doing is he'd been doing Roth 401k contributions, and he had even been converting Roth assets at a pretty high tax bracket. That may or may not make sense. You need to make some assumptions about where your current tax rate is now, where you think your tax rate will be in retirement, and that'll depend on your bucket strategy, which we'll talk about a little bit. And you need to make the assessment, is it actually advantageous for me to only build Roth now? Because there are cases where it makes sense to do both. While we're saying that we love Roth, we're not saying that we love Roth at all costs. So I want to, because you just said something key. I want to tell you the two points that Bo just made. Made. If you're trying to figure out Roth versus traditional, because realize on 401ks, 403bs, there's no income limits to them. So even if you're a high income person, you can make the election to do a Roth 401k. But you have to ask answer two questions first. What do you think is going to happen with tax policy? Meaning, do you think tax rates will be going up in the long term? And the second is, will I, will my taxes be lower in retirement because maybe my income is going to be lower? than they are while I'm working. If you can answer those two questions, you can now navigate into this kind of decision matrix we've created. We kind of have a thought process on the decision of Roth versus traditional on your 401k or 403b with this. It's really a combination of your federal plus your state income tax yep. rate. And that that rate, and we've gone back and forth between 25 to 30%. Mm-hmm. If you're over 30% on the taxes you're paying, you probably want to consider the traditional track, meaning right. you take the tax deduction on the front end because what your hope is, is that when you actually reach retirement, you don't have all that earned income flowing in and you can now manipulate it, especially if you have the bucket strategy, mm-hmm. you can manipulate what your taxes are, your income is in retirement, and you can figure out how to lower your tax rate. If that's the case, like I said, higher tax brackets, you might want to consider traditional. If you're 25 to 30, you're kind of in that gray zone. You will need to figure out, and once again, answering those two questions I shared, it's a it's a toss-up. I'm going to let you make the decision. Now, if the number's less than 25%, you're probably Roth, Roth especially if your you're friend. a younger person and you have more time for the compounding. 25% cumulative rate between your federal and your state 
it's probably a good decision to consider foregoing the current tax deduction so you can get all that compounding tax-free growth. That's going to be really powerful for you in the long term. So then a lot of folks say, okay, guys, I hear you, uh, but I don't I don't know what tax rates are going to be in the future. I don't know if they're going to go up. So how on earth can I make decisions today based on things that might not come to fruition for 20 or 30 or 40 years? That is the very reason why we talk about our bucket strategy. Yeah. When you get to retirement, as you build to financial independence, we actually want you to have three distinct tax buckets. We want you to have the pre-tax bucket. So if you're a high income earner, this is where those 401k contributions are going in so that you can take advantage of that. Or maybe if you're doing Roth, this is where your employer contributions go in. So you probably are going to have some pre-tax bucket. We also want you to have your tax-free bucket. That's your Roth, where if you are below the income threshold, you can contribute. Or even, I saw someone here said, yeah, well, the income limit, my Roth is limited. That may be your case, but you ought to look, is there a way that you could structure assets to potentially do some conversions that would allow you to contribute more tax-free? You want your tax-free bucket. And then the third bucket, and this is the bucket that a lot of people kind of overlook, is your after-tax bucket, just your regular plain old brokerage account. The reason we like these three buckets is when you get to retirement and you have all three, no matter where tax policy is, if tax rates are super, super high or super, super low, you get to control your tax situation because you can pull from the buckets as needed to maximize low tax brackets and avoid higher tax brackets. If you can build up those buckets, it's going to give you maximum flexibility in your financial independence. No doubt. Thank you for describing the bucket system, because I think that is a big part. If you're going to have the ability to manipulate tax policy in retirement, you've got to have multiple, just like you have diversification of your portfolio, you want to have diversification of the tax buckets your accounts are held in. Here's something, I I had this conversation over the weekend with some neighbors. Um, They were very excited that their plan offered like mega Roth conversions and other things. But a lot of small business owners and executives, you know that between your salary deferral and the profit sharing of the company, you can get around $57,000 into retirement accounts. But I want all my small business owners and I want all my executives that have control over the retirement plan to understand there's actually an extra points option here. Mm -hmm. Is that, yes, normal retirement plans with a profit sharing allow you to do around 57,000 if you're under 50, even more if you're over 50. But there's extra points. You can set up a strap-on type um, bolt-on retirement plan called a cash balance plan that goes on, sits on top of those other retirement plans. Now, this is more structured like a pension instead of a defined contribution. So because it's got actuaries calculating the numbers, mm-hmm. The savings are incredible. Meaning, I mean, we have clients that are saving a hundred, hundred and fifty, up to two hundred thousand dollars additional. So you have to be in a high income situation. Sure. And what I like about these, a lot of times pensions in the past had a lot of insurance type products at high cost. These new cash balance plans allow you to put index funds low costs. You just got to make sure that they're not cheap to structure but they are tremendous in the value they can have in the long term. So that's more of an advanced strategy for higher income people, but it's something we want to make sure. This is what wealthy people know about avoiding taxes and make sure you know those strategies as well. And so we had kind of suggested to you the ultra wealthy, they set up these like private foundations and they use charitable giving as a mechanism. What we'd be remiss if we didn't say there is actually a way for even folks who aren't necessarily that ultra high net worth worth area to still do advanced charitable planning. A really great solution out there is using something that's called a donor advised fund or a charitable gift fund where you can actually, instead of giving cash to your favorite organizations, you can give appreciated security. So maybe you are that person that bought Tesla and you made a thousand percent on, you think, you know what? I wanna like cash in on this, but I don't wanna pay the tax that stock might be a great thing for you to gift to your charitable gift fund. You will get a tax deduction for the amount of the contribution and you don't have to pay any tax on the gain. Or maybe you're someone because the standard deduction is so high, you're not actually getting to deduct your charitable Mm -hmm. contributions any longer. Maybe instead of trying to contribute on a year by year basis, you double up every two years. Instead of doing $10,000 to charity a year, you do 20000 every two years, and you use a charitable gift fund or a donor advised fund to do that, it's a fantastic mechanism to still do what you were doing anyways, but to do it more efficiently to cut over, cut, cut back on the lifetime taxes that you pay. Yeah, I, I, we talk about this all the time. I think 
if you're a generous minded person or you tithe to your church and other things, you really ought to look at these these charitable planning strategies with a donor advised fund, Fidelity Investments, Charles Schwab. What I like about these things is that they also allow you, if you have something as simple as an S&P 500 fund that's highly appreciated, you can even use it on mutual funds yep. and ETFs. It doesn't matter what they are, whereas that has not always been the case. So consider doing your research on those charitable planning opportunities. Let's talk about number four. Wealthy people understand their why. Yeah, this one, uh, I'm glad that we saved this one to last because it, it's for me, it's less nuts and bolts. Mm -hmm. It's more the big picture, big vision. They understand that wealth is a tool to accomplish the things that they value, it's not the goal in and of itself. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's the maturing of a, of a mindset of kind of mastering, reaching that level of wealth, that stage of wealth mm -hmm. that you kind of understand that money is a tool. Um, here's some things that I thought were indicators or things that you ought to try to aspire to, is that most, a lot of successful people, they actually enjoy their jobs. That's a yeah. Millionaire Next Door echo. You know, if you go look at the traits of from the Millionaire Next Door book, uh, same like that's right behind me is that they know what they were put on the earth to do and they feel like they're involved with it. So they actually enjoy their jobs. They also are, are contrarians. They don't just follow the herd. So just because the Joneses have the big house and the big fancy car, if that's not something they place value on, they're not going to make that decision. They're willing to go against the grain to build real wealth, not just appear to be wealthy. I'll tell you another place I see that happening is that think about the fact when we have downturns in the economy and the markets get really scary and volatile, people who are kind of on the aspirational or just starting out, they get very scared. You yep. know, they're, they're kind of looking for it's that whole emotional cycle of they're trying to figure out how they can stop the pain and get out of it. Successful people are contrarians. Yep. They're typically, it's not uncommon for our, our, our more successful clients when markets go down, they're calling us up saying, hey, I see that the markets are down, you know, 10%. I got, some extra cash. I got some extra cash. How do we get that money working? That's a contrarian mentality that I think reads to long, leads to long-term success. They also, you, you kind of alluded to this in the, in the setup on this, Bo, is that I think successful people recognize that money is a tool. It's not the actual goal. Right. And, and we've done shows on the dark side of success and wealth and the fact that I think if your whole goal is I just want to be rich, you're going to find it's really empty. You're missing it. Because um, it's the whole thing, like people think money is going to equate to happiness. And I think that they will quickly find is that their goal is not actually happiness. Mm -hmm. Happiness um, in financial terms is you can cover the basics. You don't have to uh, aspire to, to feed your family, yep. to buy clothes and have shelter. What you're really your goal is is fulfillment, mm -hmm. a, a life well lived. And that is not as easy to come by. So you kind of have to recognize you have to come to some understanding or maturing that this thing that I'm striving for is more of a tool than the actual goal that I think Rich is going to give me. Yeah, and that was, you know, as we were trying to think about like strategies to consider, you know, things you can think about personally. That's one that's perfect. Un understanding the difference in happiness and fulfillment. Mm -hmm. uh, another one we had said was focusing on experiences as a as opposed to focusing on things. As a so, you know, again, we had this car accident yesterday, and I was talking to my girls because they were scared, right? They're yeah. little kids, and I was like, "Hey, girls, you know what's so awesome? You girls are healthy, and you and mommy didn't get hurt. It's okay. We can replace the car. The thing that matters is that you guys are safe." I think even if we can think about that in our financial life, the things that we do and the experiences that we have matter so much more than the things that just kind of dwindle and turn into dust. Well, yeah, you know, I, I think I'll even expand it to, this is why I talk about travel or doing activities. It doesn't even have to be expensive. Sometimes the cheapest mm -hmm. stuff, you know, my childhood vacations growing up, and I talk about this, is my parents didn't have money. My dad was unemployed for a period of time there when, when, I, when I was a teenager. We went to timeshare presentations as our vacations, and those. But the, you know what's funny is that they were cheap, and you know it might, might have even gotten paid to do yeah. these things. But the memories have blossomed. What, what now looks back as an odd thing behavior my parents did is now sweet it's got memory. a sweet memory yeah. to me. So memories. That's why. Whereas sometimes when you buy stuff, it just gets old. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it, it, that's the bad thing about stuff yep. is that it, it tends to not shine forever. Um, 
I also thought, here's something. We always hear the saying, it's better to give than to receive. Yep. When you get to a level of success, I think you're going to find that paying it forward actually has tremendous mm-hmm. dividends. I mean, I'm talking about mentoring younger people that yep. you can share your skill set. Um, I'm talking about also that you don't mind doing the charitable giving. Yep. I mean, there is something, if you are successful... Make sure the abundance cycle doesn't stop just with the money guy show. Make sure you also are paying it forward. I think you'll find that that is very fulfilling and helps wake you up in the morning. You get out of bed knowing that you are making the world a little bit better just because you're participating in some of these activities. So uh, obviously we've kind of walked through what wealthy people focus on, the things that kind of occupy their mind, where they focus their efforts. We thought it would be valuable too to kind of share with you guys all right, what is it that wealthy people worry about? And this is really more about what they don't worry about, the things that you're not going to hear. But we want to say, okay, well, wealthy people, when they think about their finances, they think about things that should be concerning them, what are the things that are kind of on their mind? And by the way, you guys, you some of you, these are echoes from some of the stuff that's placed in the comment yep, section. Absolutely. So I want to give you guys some kudos on that. But let's talk about these. The One of the first things I hear a lot of wealthy people talk about is they are worried about inflation. Sure. We've had an extended period of time with interest rates being at close to zero or super low. And people, you, you kind of alluded to this earlier, Bo, they recognize that with all the debt that a lot of the governments of the world have, that the only way you can get out of debt when it gets to be so it also it's so big that it almost seems like the Sunday comics mm-hmm. is that you kind of have to inflate your currency yep. at some point. And I, look, I'm not trying to be... Uh, scare you guys, because I think that we could go many, many years, as we've seen with super low interest rates, especially when all the central banks are kind of colluding to keep interest Mm -hmm. rates low. But it is something to be aware of. At some point, interest rates will go up. Inflation is starting to creep in. I had a builder friend of mine share that that, uh, plywood that normally is under $10 a sheet Mm -hmm. is now over $30 a sheet. When I hear stuff like that, I'm like, wow. There's inflation kind of creeping into things that are not in the CPI, which is what the government uses to measure inflation. So here's what we know. How do you combat inflation and this concern that the dollar might be decreasing in value? There, there. You, you really, you own stuff. That's but right. Bo, we talked about this in show prep, and there's actually, I thought, once again, going back to the Oracle of Omaha, Warren Buffett, he said if you ever get overwhelmed or you start getting nervous about what the state of the economy and how will we make it through inflationary times, and he had a, a great share about Coca-Cola and wages. What, 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 how does that go? Yeah, he was essentially saying so long as we live in this world where you're willing to trade a little bit of your time to do a vocation, and for that time, you get some dollars and with those dollars that you receive, you go and buy a Coca-Cola, and that Coca-Cola was manufactured by someone who was willing to trade their time for a few dollars. And that, so long as we live in that type of society, if you own businesses, if you own real assets, you're going to be okay. Because yeah. what Coca-Cola can do is it can charge a little bit more for the products. And when they charge a little bit more for their products, they might have to pay a little bit more to the workforce. So long as that's going on, owning real assets and participating in that is going to be beneficial. And by the way, you could replace Coca-Cola for washing machines, vehicles. I mean, I think it's a great analogy for just understanding that if prices do increase, if you own stuff, just like in real estate, values go up. But just like um, when you're dealing with Coca-Cola washing machines, companies can always increase Absolutely. the prices. So pay attention to that. The second thing that I think wealthy people really worry about, and this is an important one, I don't think we have a client that this doesn't come up if they have children, and that's legacy. Yep. Um, and what I mean by this, this is both financial and non-financial, because a lot of you guys, you, you hear legacy, like, oh, they just want their name on the side of a building. No. Nope. I think what they're worried about, and this is something I've thought about, is... If you grow, if you build success, how do you not screw the kiddos up? Yeah, that's one of my, I don't want to say biggest fears because it sounds so negative. You know, mm-hmm. I, I grew up from very like humble beginnings. Li- li- uh, my childhood looks very different from what my, my daughter's childhood is presently looking like. And, and I, feel some, I feel some pressure with that. I'm like, man, I, I want them to understand the things that I was forced to understand But even though they don't even know where it's forced, how can I make sure I'm still getting that across to them? How can I make sure I'm still teaching them those things? We know the stat that 80% of millionaires are first generation. Yep. So that means second and third generations, uh, the children of that 80%, 
must be screwing it up it. somewhere. And I think that is a fear. And then also, I mean, you mentioned scarcity. Most millionaires, since we know 80%, do grow up from pretty humble beginnings. Mm-hmm. And scarcity does teach discipline. Absolutely. Because, look, your parents tell you no all the time. When you grow up, you know, and, and you know, middle class and below, you know what it's like to want to go do something and, not be, able and be told to. no. It's harder when you come from a family that things are going well. And a lot of you financial mutants will struggle this if you, as you have successes. It's hard to say no when to, to create that discipline when you don't have when to. When you don't have to. That's so right. that's what, here's what we tell people to do is make sure your children understand the value of a dollar and the power of the army of dollar bills. That's why... You know, we I always share that we do matching programs at my house to try to get my teenage daughter excited about savings. We also talk about the need to be generous yep. um, with, you know, giving, as well as the power of saying thank you, to always be gracious and understand, be a good recipient when people do stuff for you, when things are, you know, because there's always going to be, no matter how successful you are, somebody helped you to get there. So you need to be a good person that can say thank you, and 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 that will always help you to to kind of hone past the limitation that you didn't grow up with scarcity. Because I think scarcity is actually a super great trainer. Sure. So okay, so we know that uh, wealthy folks don't want to screw up their kiddos. So let's give them a benefit of the doubt and say that okay, they've raised them well. And odds are, if you plan really well, your goal is not to like leave this earth with zero. You don't want to like spend your last dollar, your last day on this earth. You're probably going to leave something behind. So one of the things that we notice that uh, wealthy, successful people try to think about is how how do I pass on assets well? How yeah. do I efficiently transition excess wealth that I've created in my lifetime so that it can be to the benefit of my heirs or my organization or the things I want to support when I'm not here? Well, the first thing, Avoid making those bad end of life decisions. I it, it makes me cringe a little bit, and I've even dealt with this with with relatives where they'll come and ask me questions and be like, "Was it okay that I changed the title on, on this piece of real estate because you know so and so's gotten sick, so it, it seems like it made it sense to get those assets out of their name as fast as possible, or worse is hey um." You know, I, I'm I'm worried about some of these end of life decisions. I'm going to put the kiddos on my joint on my checking account. Is that okay? These are all you're creating gift situations. Mm-hmm. You're also maybe blowing a, a step up in basis by passing away with appreciated holdings. These type of just reactionary type decisions people make at end of life are kind of one of my biggest pet peeves because it's, you're not making good decisions. Sometimes it's better. If you have a, a, a relative or even yourself thinking ahead from an estate planning standpoint, to die with appreciated holdings. Absolutely. I mean, because your children will receive a stepped-up asset currently, a, a basis that's higher. They won't have to pay income taxes or estate taxes because the estate tax exemption is now le- over $11 million as a combined couple, $22 million. Yep. I mean, these are high enough limits that there are definitely good ways to do this. So, so make sure you focus on the structure instead of just making those knee-jerk reactions and getting yourself in a pickle I, of a situation. That's what I was going to say. Society tells us that, oh, it's got to be complicated. It's got to be advanced. It's got to be sophisticated. When realistically, the things you ought to be doing if you're worried about legacy are pretty simple. Make sure that your estate documents are updated. Make sure you have mm-hmm. wills and healthcare directors and powers of attorney. Make sure that the beneficiaries on your retirement accounts are structured to match your estate plan. Make sure that beneficiaries on life insurance is structured correctly. You don't have to do all the complicated, crazy, hard stuff. Sometimes just getting the very small, very easy things right is enough. Yeah, definitely focus on those things. And I, I think between training the kids well as well as structuring you will have a great legacy to pay it forward, and your you will your financial mutant ways will hopefully pay it to, forward to the next generation Absolutely. as well. The the other thing I thought that the third thing that wealthy people worry about, and this is longevity. And I've always liked if you've watched that um, Warren Buffett documentary uh, on HBO, he starts off that 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 documentary sharing that he goes and speaks to a college class and he says, I believe it's an accounting class because that's not shared, but I saw the, the textbooks. That's how nerdy I am. <laughs> you, you I wanted, to know, I wanted to know what class he was talking to. And it was an accounting class. And he told them, look, I'm going to tell you as a wealthy person, what if I came in here and offered you any car you wanted, but there was one catch. You can only have that car 
for your entire life. You only get Meaning one car. You get That's one it. car, and it's got to make it your entire life. And then he brought it to that what he's talking about is you. I mean, if you think about it, when you come out, you are, your body is all you get. Mm-hmm. You only get one heart, two kidneys, you know, the liver, you know, your brain, it's all just, that's it. So you better take care of it. You better treat it. Cause I think we take that for granted when we're younger. And as we get older, you got to focus on not only keeping the brain sharp by reading, expanding your knowledge, but also exercising and getting that annual physical. Yep. Those things will keep you you're safe to focus on the physical aspects of longevity. And there's nothing wrong with being a prolific saver. One of the reasons we've even built the financial order of operations is so that you don't feel like you have to be a miser. and You don't have to have a 70, 80, 90% savings rate. But if you can get your savings rate right early on and you can get to that 20 to 25% savings, one of the best ways you can combat living a long time is to make sure you have a very strong army of dollar bills That's a great way to combat living too long. Make sure you saved enough and make sure you saved well. I want to close out the show, Bo, because we're in unique times right Mm -hmm. now. I feel like we're a country that's got um, some turmoil and some other things. And I'm always, I'm 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 definitely a glass half full type personality. Call me an optimist. I love it. I mean, because then we know from our own research, optimists do better in life. So, so take a life lesson from that. But we are dealing with, and you had a great saying, Bo. I thought this was kind of a, a nice way to close it because we were talking about things that wealthy people do not worry about. And you had a saying talking, it was kind of, I envisioned like a monopoly board. Yeah. What, what was that saying? Yeah, I said, with all this stuff going on in the world, uh, we don't get to design the board. And like we individually, even specifically, don't get to like write the rules. All we get to do is move our piece. We get to just move our piece the way we move it. But if you can move your piece well, given the design of the board and given what the rules are, odds are you're going to be okay. Well, and, and that's what we talked about in our, up to our recent quarterly commentary that we just recorded for clients is we don't make decisions on what we think will that's happen. Because right. think, look, humans, we all have lots of blind spots. We all make decisions. And it ties into your game piece analogy you just talked about. We make our decisions off of what your goals are, mm-hmm. what your age, what your risk, as well as what we know the rules currently are. So yep. don't get caught up in all this other stuff. And that leads to, just like we have market volatility that might be coming, we've had a lot of political stuff. Oh, yeah. And once again, you, you've been on fire with your sayings recently. <laughs> you had a great political statement, too. What, what was that statement? I said, doesn't it's, it's not red or blue. Uh, our money's always green. And that's <laughs> so, the thing you need to focus on. It doesn't matter, red or blue, the money stays green. So focus on those things. Don't let the noise get you down, guys. Because we're, we're going we're to always go through periods where it's going to feel like it's unique, a new paradigm. And that's just, that's that's something you've got to be very aware of is that know your goals, know what you're, you're aspiring to, and that's going to help you. And then here's the last thing. It's kind of know what your why is and know what makes you happy because having more of it is not necessarily going to lead to more happiness. Mm-hmm. And I think this is something I have found as I've matured in my walk with wealth creation is that we have a tendency, the more we have, we tend to move the goalposts and the goals. You need to figure out your why so you know what contentment is, what is actually what leads you to feeling a fulfilled life. And that's going to be the part that lets you wake up, feel good, that you are making the world better every day. And that's the at the end of the day, that's all you can hope for and hope that you can build kiddos that are doing it right, that you're, you have the, the life that you've always dreamed up and become the best version of your financial self. That's what we hope to share on the Money Guy Show. And we just thank you, thank you, thank you for coming in and joining us. Go make sure you can see we're now over 100,000 subscribers. Make sure you give us a, a subscribe on YouTube. Yep. Make sure also that if you, you're making those... Those, those strides of success, you, you've been uh, listening, you've come and you've taken advantage of the abundance cycle, you've learned, applied and growed these, kind of grew into the, the a level of success that you're looking at yourself and going, man, what do I not know? Or wouldn't it be nice if I had a co-pilot to help me make these big decisions? We do work with clients all across the country, but um, and we that's why we give it away. We want you guys to make good financial decisions so you can be the best version of yourself. And we appreciate you. Jumping into the shows, how wealthy people save and spend their money. I'm your host, Brian Preston, Mr. Bo Hansen, Money Guy Team, out.